Hey, this is Complexity Medicine. Welcome to Gateways and Bridges, an improvised and interactive inquiry exploring health and wholeness through performative and exploratory frames and metaphors. I'm artist Andy McClure, and this is Dr. William Sutherland, your hosts. friend. So here we are. How are you tonight? And that is the question. So I'm going to start with an honest answer because I think it's the best one. I am not okay. in. You know the, what though? Yeah. Um, Okay, sorry. Uh, you were just uh, technologically lagging there, so I wasn't sure if um, you'd entered into a time-space thing, or you were frozen, and it might be my internet. But um, I was just going to say, an honest answer is a good one, uh, but a creative answer is even better. <laughs> True. So I'm going to fight the hesitation to hit start again and to go back to the beginning i'm going to take the lag and i'm going to take my honesty and i'm going to switch it around and find something that's a little more creative so first honestly i am yeah and, I, and, and honestly and i guess it gets always ironically right because here we are talking about something around the nature and the notions of health. Um, but tonight, in a specific way, I'm struggling um, with illness. And in this last number of months, I have developed um, what's well, a relatively benign heart arrhythmia, known as atrial fibrillation. But nonetheless, when it comes on for me, it um, creates some symptoms and I don't feel overly well. And just minutes before we planned to meet tonight, it happened to kick in. And uh, all of its resulting symptomology. And it's always an interesting moment because in that moment of not feeling well, you know, there's the, the first urge is to retreat and to do little or to do nothing or to shut it all down. And I don't know if that is always the wisest of choices. Um, I know in my own life that that often, that sometimes it's the right choice, especially when I'm feeling, you know, when there's rest needed. But at other times, I do find that it, it, it makes my life small. So first and foremost, I'm glad that I didn't choose to shut everything down tonight and that we did choose to come together and, and um, have this conversation. So that's the honest part. So now to your challenge about the creative one. So what is atrial fibrillation. Well, it is a rhythmic irregularity. It is a breaking from the regular beat. It is syncopation. It is misstep. It is dissonance. Disson 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 it is a pitter-patter and a jitter-jatter. Yeah, it's a lot of things. And so... I think then, you know, from a greater perspective, where do we start with rhythm tonight? Where do we go with something about rhythm? Mm. Or a, you know, and not just rhythmicity, but a rhythmicity. Yeah. Now, if I memory serves me correct, don't you have a drum in your office? No longer. <laughs> Is that because the neighbors complained? <laughs> I don't know what happened to it, but it's uh, it is not here anymore. <laughs> I think I just solved your problem. You're missing a drum. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> there you go. That, that would be. <laughs> I'll take that. Actually, I'll take that as a solution. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you're in your office right now, a place where you're where you're there, helping to support. Um, 
um, rhythms that have uh, become problematic in some way, right? Um, entrained in some way, uh, too regular in some way. There has to be something important about that irregular rhythm um, in terms of change. You know, it's interesting. Um, as you're talking, what it reminds me of, and, and again, today's conversation will be, it's just one of these ones of us jamming and talking and, and uh, where it takes us. And the one thing that I, I think about is, I think a lot of people in, when they think about health, think that health is somehow a perfect ordering and uh, that health in it is, you know, an unwavering rhythm that, uh, that the, the, the periodicity, the note is always following exactly, you know, in, in a proper and strict cadence. And it turns out in the body that that's probably not true. That that's probably not true for living systems. That perfect repeatability is not what we're looking for. But indeed, what we're looking for is variability. You know, for example, in the heart, there's something called heart rate variability, HRV. And HRV is actually a sign of a healthy heart. It takes into account the autonomic nervous system functioning. And, and what it says is that a heart that has a broad range of beat to beat variability um, is actually a healthier heart and representative of a healthier system than that one is always periodically true. So, yeah, you know, I think that, 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 that when we take that, you know, beyond just the, the specific organ of the heart, and of course we know this is actually probably true in, in uh, many aspects, whether it be like hormonal regulation or circadian rhythms or these different types of things that are clocked and have rhythm, that some degree of variability rather than the staticness um, is a sign of health. And so one of the things that we want to get back in our life is this idea of a greater variability, a greater variability in our rhythms, our biological rhythms, our social rhythms, the natural rhythms that we interact with and entrain to, um, but that somehow in there, the notion of a variability rather than a predictability is part of it. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. I, I texted you today and said, um, how are you feeling today? And uh, your, <laughs> your response back was, um, bobbing in the waves <laughs> with a little emoji of a you know an ocean and um it just it reminds me of you know sort of we um we when you're on a when you're a little kid and you're drawing the ocean or you're drawing waves you draw this sort of regular rhythmic um pattern but if you're in a boat especially if you're out in the ocean and you're actually looking at the surface of the water you realize that you know, there is very little predictability about the waves because the waves are coming from all kinds of different directions and they're of different heights and different intensities and there's sort of swells that come, but, but, but there's a, there's a, um, a variety uh, happening on the surface. And when the ocean is perfectly still, it's funny because we, we then, you know, you sort of look across the landscape of the, of the water, you look into the distance of, you know, the horizon, but your attention, or at least for me, my attention then actually starts to focus on what's below the surface of the water. You know, like what's down in the depths, what's down beneath the boat. Um, and then when it's wavy again, when things are all happening, all of my attention is actually on just on watching that dynamic on watching that dance um occurring <laughs> on the surface and um and and i i kind of like that the idea that um you know that maybe our systems specifically are you know like our heart has a kind of irregularity to it um in a way to sort of like um create attention um you know, you 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 have to pay attention. The system has to pay attention in some way to those fluctuations 
in the same way that we we stop paying attention if something becomes too regular, too um, repetition. I think that so a couple of things there in what you're saying that in this right in this moment. So there's a, a notion in complexity thought, complex adaptive systems, living systems, uh, a notion what they which they call or has been called. I think it was coined by Holland. What they call the edge of chaos that life is to be found at the edge of chaos. And the edge of chaos is a position between two positions, um, the chaotic, um, which is not to be confused with noise, you know, not just like a, you know, just pure entropy, but, but rather, um, yeah, the, the, the notion of, 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 um, of, un, you know, of, 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 a, of a type of unpredictability, right? Again, I, I I'm, I'm trying to define the word with the same word, but a, a chaotic presence, right? Where the sort of stirring and turmoil of, and, uh, and a degree of disorganization. It's not to say that there's not pattern in chaos, but the pattern of chaos is always in flux and changing. And it's a, you know, it's going to be a pattern of a much deeper order. On the other side, we have the obviously ordered and patterned, um, you know, of blatant symmetries or, are um, uh, periodic scales or these kind of things where uh, everything is exactly and uh, precisely um, configured. And it turns out life doesn't do well in either of these positions. Uh, it doesn't do well in the strictly ordered and it does not do well in the strictly chaotic. And then from a pers perspective of health, we can think of disease as a progression into either one off of these tensions as we leave the edge of chaos into further chaos this is going to show itself as a disease process as we should fall off into further ordering, deeper ordering the loss of the complexification of the system. This is going to show itself as an illness process. So somehow we have to stay in that tension of this edge, this edge where life happens, this edge of chaos. And certainly heart rate variability is that sense of tension, right? Playing these beat to beat variability, not too ordered, not too chaotic, right? Living in the right place. So to swing back to my experience right now with this arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation, you know, what I would say is on, on the one level, I would say this is an illness that is um, starting to push into the chaotic, right? It's becoming uh, too aperiodic, too unpredictable, too much variability between the beats. Um, we are losing the balance of the tension, right? That is held by that ordered position. And I, I wouldn't want to stop there, though. I mean, if we stop there, you got me thinking to say, okay, what what do we think then? So, so that's so we're getting to these choppy seas, we're getting these interference patterns, we're seeing these waves colliding, you know, creating synergies, creating interference, you know, higher troughs, uh, deeper crests, sorry, um, deeper troughs, higher crests, uh, working our way, you know, in, in that kind of thing, but. Um, but there was a, which is a good point though, which is, okay, in this moment, what's deeper, right? We're, we're, we're having this show itself in this, in the case of my heart arrhythmia in this moment, this chaotic or more chaotic presentation with its effect. You know, this is an opportunity to go deeper, right? To get underneath those wave patterns and say, okay, what is it that is holding this or driving this towards this state? And so the idea that we use it as a moment of reflection, right? To say, okay, well, what's our next step going to be? And that next step is a different kind of rhythm that will ultimately play with this rhythm from a deeper level, if we do it right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I'm, I tend to be very um, visual in, in my thinking. So, and I, I use a lot of um, metaphors. So, I, you know, in, in just you talking, I'm sort of picturing this um, sailing boat. And I think about, you know, the, the, the wind stopped and the ocean flat. And that, you know, that's not a great place to be. And there's a, there's a, a time of patience and reflection and waiting and, and, and that, and, and, uh, and I'm thinking about this sort of the chaos of of waves on the ocean, and actually, you know, at the times that I've been in a boat and and had my head over the side and watching the water, um, 
and I, I, I kind of, I can picture on that sailboat, you know, me sort of on the edge of the boat, watching the surface of the boat and our waves and seeing all of that um, turbulence and the sailor of the boat walking back and forth without losing balance because they have been on that boat so long that they recognize its movements without knowing or needing to see the waves. They know when it's rising, they know when it's falling, they know when it's tipping and turning. And I imagine that that sailor, if there was something dragging on the boat, if there was something hanging off the edge, something in the water, something pulling the boat, you know, in one way or another, that they would feel it in their body. They would feel the, the imbalance of the boat in their body without needing to actually know what it is, that, that, it, that it was there, that it was, it was calling attention in the boat itself to that. And um, I wonder if sort of, you know, in, in trying to take this kind of level of thinking to, um, you know, the heart itself and its rhythm, what's the bigger systems at play there? Like, how does the, how does the body in its totality, how does the, how does Bill um, recognize those imbalances in the ship <laughs> that he is so um, attuned to um, that might, you know, that might be interesting or creative possibilities for some, some introspection or change or attention. I have a hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, it's a good question. Um, you know, the first answer that pops up in my head, and it was in the analogy early when you were talking there, which is, uh, despite the fact that the seas are turbulent, right. And unpredictable, the skipper or the captain of the ship or the deck hand that's been on it for so long is walking up and down the deck with assured footsteps despite the underlying mm -hmm. turbulence, right? That even though it's not calm seas, they have a confidence both in their ability to um, navigate their balancing as they walk about and in the wholeness of the ship that is still keeping them afloat. And so here they are well-practiced in, in walking over those, um, you know, like, uh, you know, essentially walking in relationship to those turbulent wave structures that are coming through and threatening to off balance them. And they're not off balanced. The new person onto the ship might be off balanced, but they're not off balanced. And I think that that's a really good position because for those of us that are struggling with an illness experience, um, whether it's new and acute or it's been with us, you know, chronically over time, the, it, the illness experience is always threatening to off balance, right? I mean, it's always threatening to, well, like one of two ways. I mean, it, it could be, you know, there's lots of illness of inertia, the opposite, like you said, of the calm seas that the doldrums were not going anywhere, but let's just stay with this example of the ones that are, you know, again, threatening to throw us off balance and it's turbulence. So one of the things then says the response for health is to become better at walking on the deck, right? Like we're not necessarily controlling the seas. Uh, we're not settling the waves. We're not in command of the weather or the fronts, the different types of things that are coming in, you know, that we don't necessarily know the reef structures underneath and the currents and, you know, all the things that are conspiring for this to happen, but we can become skilled in being present in turbulent moments. Um, and that's not easy. Um, but the weather doesn't care if it's easy or not. You know, the waves that are rising don't care if it's easy or not. Um, the fact that it's not easy is, is in many ways irrelevant. Um, but we have a choice in that. Do we be skilled or do we be not skilled? And I struggle with that, you know, with my atrial fib, for example, among other, uh, parts of my, of my health conditions, you know, it's, it's really easy to be off balanced. Like I said today, you know, when I felt it, you know, kick in and I feel it is pressure in the chest and, you know, these different things. And it's like, ah, oh, geez, it's there. I know right away. And, and I want to go, you know, below deck. And just ride it out, right? But we'd be missing this conversation tonight. And then the second part of the metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the parts of the boat, you know, that that are, 
you know, are the parts of the ocean or the boat and its relationship, right? That are not just the heart, right? Like we're not just focused on one parameter here. Uh, there is always this sort of whole body in this whole relationship in this whole context. Um, and yeah, I'm going to have to give that some more thought, like as to, I mean, I think this is where we, you know, where maybe I have to be careful not to, you know, to say, well, I've already tried that or done that, but this is where we start to look <laughs> broader afield, right. As to the con how we can, what, 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 parts of the context we have control of in terms of say like our diet, for example, or of how we move through the world or um, the nature of our relationship to stress and to anxieties and to those things that would look to off-center or dysregulate us. Um, it's almost cliche in this day and age. We, we talk so much about these things, but to really always be engaging them deeply and newly and freshly each day, I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that there's, I mean, one of the sort of traps of all of this, right, is that we, is that we, um, we start looking um, back to that uh, linear language of cause effect and, you know, sort of chasing that around, looking for um, the connective loops for those things. And, you know, sometimes the, the you know, in terms of being creative, uh, sometimes the the best opportunities for you in terms of like creating new senses of attention or new kinds of awareness is actually by you know looking out of the corner of your eye at something or having something change which you don't know how to deal with, so it forces you to invent um, to um, create novelty, right? Like so. Can you imagine a scenario where you um, you had a drummer who um, who was a very good drummer, was an excellent drummer, knew how to drum, you know, very well. He's a great musician, and you wanted to help them get better by taking their drum. Um, <laughs> can you imagine a scenario where removing the drum, the drum set, or the drums from a drummer would make them a better drummer or a different drummer or increase their understanding of the nature of drumming by doing so? Yeah, it's funny. I guess I'm hit by what you're saying on two parts, right? On one part, in the abstraction, I really like it. You know, in the abstraction, I'm like, oh, it's a great idea. And then when I think about what that would mean in my own life, I hate it, <laughs> right? You know, the idea that um, <laughs> I have these, you know, that whatever my own competencies are, like I'm not a drummer per se, but... I certainly have whatever would be the equivalent competencies in my life, you know, and I'm dependent and I, I, I lean onto those. And in particular, as things get harder, I lean and anchor onto those even more. And here you are proposing, well, what if we just had all of those, you know, that analogous uh, drum, just what if the thing was to take that away? And I'm reminded of a story of a, a great health innovator, uh, Moshe Feldenkrais, who, um, came up with the Feldenkrais method of, of movement. And he was um, a Jewish physicist and uh, living, I believe, in France uh, at, after World War I. I believe it was World War I. I could be off on my facts here, but I'm just going with this, what I remember of the story. But um, as I had heard it, I, I believe he, had, he was also a judo instructor, a judo instructor and, and um, I believe he had done significant ligamentous damage to both of his knees you know, in the practice of judo and he loved his judo and he was this early instructor and a force in the you know these nascent martial arts from from the east that has made its way into europe and um and you know as rigorous martial arts practice can do there's injury and so here he has this you know significant ligamentous damage to his knee and knees and he's offered up the surgeries of the time, remembering that this is uh, you know post uh, World War One, which is not all the fancy arthroscopic surgery and, and and ligament replacements that we have now. He was offered fusion. You can have your knees fused in a certain position. <laughs> There's talk about a talk about if you're talking between order and chaos. Talk about a type of ordered stability, right? A knee that can't move, just purely <laughs> fused. And uh, think of the, yeah. the consequence of cascading effects and the loss of freedoms and mobility. And the man, you know, not only loved his judo, but he loved to walk. <laughs> and so 
So here he was, you know, like you said, having his proverbial drum taken from him in all ways, the actual functionality of his knees, the martial art that he loved, you know, all of these things that he had uh, organized himself and his sense of self and his sense of movement and his sense of way of moving through a world. And all of a sudden they're all taken away and they're being threatened to be replaced with much less. And so what does he do with that? Well, I think most of us would fall into our grief and loss and become frozen in that, uh, you know, very reduced, you know, we, we, we'd, we'd, we'd fall into the sense of reduction, but not Moshe Feldenkrais. He started to ask with, you know, every movement of his body, you know, he made it an inquiry, you know, how can I walk? Uh, is walking just something about the knees and the legs and the feet or is walking a whole body affair is walking, uh, you know, a whole context affair is walking a cultural affair. What is walking? You know, of course, then from what is walking, you know, what is moving of any sort? What is, what is drinking? What is writing? What is breathing? You know, what is the relationship between these things? How are they integrated? And so in the midst of his loss, he develops this, you know, remarkable system of movement and therapy, you know, that's highly refined, very subtle, very nuanced, letting people get into connections with these deeper aspects of their self and their body. It's really quite, and again, if I, I apologize if the details are wrong, but the, the spirit of the story is right. And it's a remarkable one. And he's not alone. There's been a lot of people that have had, you know, that life has conspired to take away their drum, even though they were drummers. And then, like you said, they learned to play on so many more instruments. Um, and not only that, they, they learned to um, conduct orchestras and compose and become musicians of a much higher order you know, in whatever their field was. And in the case of Moshe Feldenkrais, it was, he became a, a composer and orchestrator of movement uh, in ways that, you know, much of the world really had never ever seen before. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know the exact story again, but um, I remember hearing uh, uh, the uh, Bare Naked Ladies uh, drummer uh, when he was young and in school, uh, his teachers used to always tell him to stop moving because um, he was he was always tapping the desk and he was always jigging his leg and you know I can totally relate to that. I'm uh, my my wife hates uh, me jigging, um, rocking my bouncing my leg. I'm a pretty attention deficit person and I have a very hard time sitting still. I I rock or move or bounce my leg or, or whatever. There's almost like this rhythm that's, um, needs to, um, be there in order for my brain to settle. My body has to like move to vibrate in some way. And, um, and, uh, the story of the drummer, um, whose name escapes me right now. I try to find that. Um, he, of course, you know, persisted because that's how he related to the world. That's how he connected to the world. He connected to it in rhythm. And um, they, they, those movements that he was doing were just a natural um, inclination for him, a, a way of, um, you know, being. <laughs> the, the, the ocean that is underlying his internal self. Um, that, you know, once he became a drummer, he just learned that that was the ship that he was on. Um, and I, you know, I, um, I rem the reason I asked about the drum in your office is that I, I do remember it, seeing it there. I remember seeing it there. And I remember thinking that um, some of your patients uh, must come in and see the drum and wonder sort of like, oh, why is there a drum in here? Like, how is that, how is that connected to the idea of healing? Um, but, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at how often rhythm is such a core component of so many ceremonies all over the world. And some of our earliest sort of social gatherings connecting was around banging that drum and hitting that drum and our own experiences, you know, um, in the sweat lodge with the little boy drum, it's such an important part of our you know, story is our friendship and um, uh, the way in, in which we, um, in which we connect. So I'm, I, uh, you know, I think I'm starting off with 
your heart and then uh, and its rhythm is kind of a really a beautiful place to sort of begin a lot of these conversations, right? Because I think at the core of so much of, you know, our, our sense of ourselves in the world is about those rhythms, those patterns that become, you know, a drummer or a jazz musician or a, uh, a therapist or an artist or whatever it is that the, that there is this um, story in rhythm that underlies all of it. That's, that's, you know, that's bigger than the rhythm itself. The, um, it's funny you mentioned, uh, I, I believe the drummer's name was Tyler Stewart and, um, Tyler Stewart. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. and my wife went to school with him. He went to uh, primary school. <laughs> I with Tyler and it was true. He was, he had drumsticks and they were constantly being taken away by the teachers and put in desks and returned to him at the end <laughs> of the day. He drum on anything and everything all day long, apparently, according to you know, the stories. And of course the classic lines, like, you know, you'll, you know, you, well, you can never make anything of yourself, you know, doing this drumming business. And of course he gets the last laugh as the <laughs> drummer of the bare naked ladies and uh, their success over decades. Um, it's funny too, like, again, for those that are going to watch this on video on YouTube or what have you, um, it's a, there's interesting learnings even now, right? So as you talk about the role of the drum and the role of rhythm and the role of movement, of course, this comes across in many ways. I mean, as a physician, I really uh, take a lot of care to understand the cadence of my voice and the delivery of my speech and the message therein. It's not just the content, but the, um, the wave that it is delivered on. I think is important. I think that's part of, you know, the, our voicing. We have these words, they're weighty words, right? Our prognostications, our diagnoses, you know, these are weighty things and sometimes they're blessings and sometimes they're curses. And so we should give some thought to the cadence and rhythm that we deliver and how that's received uh, both, you know, with the, uh, the body and the mind and, you know, the soul and the sense of the soulfulness of the person, these things are, you know, you can see the impact when it is upon them. So that's an important consideration. Even here today, the way with, if you look on the screen with the setup, um, I'm going to change things next time. Um, my, uh, the way the cord is here, I had it such that it's on the chair and every time I rock the chair, I, I can hear it make a sound in the mic. So I'm stilling myself unnecessarily. Um, the point of is that, is that the rocking is that the rocking chair that you're on? Yes, exactly. This is the rocking chair and, and it's meant to be rocking, but instead I'm working desperately to still my body such that I still the chair, such that I don't move the cord, such that I don't make a noise into the microphone and annoy all the listeners, uh, you know, such that we have any, and that they'll decide to listen to this, but it's, <laughs> it's, it, but it's funny because right isn't away, that, can, isn't that like perfect? It, it is perfect because it's not representative yeah. of my health. And it's actually, it impacts the nature of the conversation. And even now, as I'm talking about it, I'm letting myself free up just a little bit more in other way. And again, so again, back to the drum, right? Which says, okay, you don't have the rocking chair. You know, we're going to take away your rocking chair today. So I'm stilling myself and it's like, okay, I have a rocking chair, but how do I move such that I don't rock the rocking chair, but I can actually start to move into my, you know, my own sense of health and be able to find air and be able to find breath and be able to find my voice without hitting this damn chord. You know, and so, and apparently it's doable because here I am starting to move and I'm not creating all sorts of unnecessary interference, uh, you know, into the recording. Um, so, you know, these, these are becoming, I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation. And, 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 you know, on that note, you know, we started roughly, you know, 35 minutes ago and I take my pulse here and. And lo and behold, Andy, I'm no longer a neutral fib, but I'm in sinus rhythm and I'm feeling better, <laughs> you know, but I don't think I'm feeling better just because it's gone from atrial fibrillation to sinus rhythm. I think that would be a mistake. I'm feeling better because I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better in our conversation. I'm feeling better in our camaraderie. I'm feeling better as we find ways to move into this conversation, you know, about rhythm and from rhythm and to rhythm, you know, and finding that way yeah. to walk that edge you know, between the chaotic and, um, the ordered and, and, and to find a way to walk, even when it is chaotic or overly ordered, 
you know, that we can still, you know, find a way to be that um, health, even when the system itself is out of balance. Yeah. And um, in terms of the, you know, the rocking chair hitting the cord and creating some di um, disruptive sounds um, in the conversation, I'm sort of, I, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Glenn Gould um, in a lot of his recordings, piano player, uh, a lot of his recordings, you can hear him breathing and you can hear the, the bench um, rocking and moving. And um, sometimes you can sort of hear him, he's kind of muttering to himself as he plays. And when they were recording him, they wanted to take out those distractions from the recording so they could just have the pure piano itself, right? But um, part of the, you know, treat <laughs> um, of listening to um, that music is actually listening for him. You know, here's this music, which is beautifully constructed and complex and, you know, has this, you know, organized pattern that is surprising and lovely and beautiful and, and chaotic. And then here is also in the sounds, these random, moments of him being there playing the music and the, the two things coexisting in a kind of unsteady balance right that that i you know that i think is kind of lovely and and if i was listening to this uh, podcast again i would listen again listening for the sound of the rocking chair hitting the court The like sound that. of Bill's rhythm being heard. It's. Uh, I, th I I love that. I, I love that. We could go back. I, I love that idea too of going back and listening differently. You know, hearing this differently with those things. Then the other thing I'd listen to is how we've changed from when we started. I mean, it's no surprise that we're new to this whole podcasting business and recording our conversations. And of course, we're on the learning curve and we'll make all the missteps and mistakes that go along with that. And I like how we're giving ourselves a lot of space for that to happen. Um, not letting uh, perfection be the enemy of the good and um, are the okay. <laughs> you know. And I think we're doing a good job. I think we're doing a good job with that. Um, but I feel different here at the end than I did at the beginning. And I hope people can see, I hope that those that are willing to listen through to the end of this, and maybe this will be a way to wrap this up, um, will listen and be generous in, the, in that we were out of rhythm in the beginning, that we were, you know, it wasn't just the, the, the beautifulness of like beat to beat variability, but we were arrhythmic we we had fallen out of step we were struggling to find our way back to even the cadence of our own natural and normal exchanges we have with our conversations for as long as we've known each other and i hope that they can see it i hope they can see how through the course of this there has been change and i like to think that we are finishing well, by far from some kind of perfect rhythmicity i mean there's whatever that means but that there is that we are finding that right, you know, that we were going back to the right tensioning again. Um, and that our health is showing in the rhythm of the conversation and the sharing therein. And, um, you know, maybe we demonstrated that today, you know, and hopefully, you know, all of those things that we started that started with a, you know, a, a misbeat, um, you know, the, the misbeats of, of, of this heart, you know, has led us to then say, okay, great. Let's look at what that is. And let's look when that is not that, you know, when we come back into a resonant and coherent position. And, and I think we have, and I'm, and I'm glad for that. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed this. Um, I've enjoyed where and, we've and I struggled in the beginning and that was fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, we sort of talked about this beforehand that um, sometimes uh, Bill, when you come from that really honest place of just sort of 
you know, here's what I'm dealing with right now. And that it opens up again, an opportunity. And um, I love that we've come around to the, um, the, the, the drum has been removed from your office. The drum is no longer in your office, or at least that drum is no longer in your office. But right now, the most important drum in your office it has been the center of our conversation. And that's your heart, right? That's, <laughs> that's the one that fills the space, that sets the rhythm, uh, that, you know, uh, leads the band. So I, I, I love that we've, <laughs> we, we've been out in the ocean and we've, we've been to Japan and we've come back and landed here as we should. That was a good journey. <laughs> <laughs> Andy is always, I, I love it. I love that we're having these conversations. I love that we are laying down the tracks um, of this and I love that we're not sure where it's going. And, um, and I, I hope that in some ways we never really do know where it's going. We, that there's always the, the freedom to, um, to wander and to be cast adrift and uh, to lose our course, you know, such that we can find it again. And I think that's great. So with that, brother, I'm going to say goodnight.